you ever feel that you're 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 sinking under a mountain of poems or an ocean? Of At least once a week. Tell At me. least once Tell a week. Me. We have so many forms, as you can see, that we could probably go into business ourselves. You ever feel it gets out, it's going to get out of control? Always. <laughs> so you're going to see two montages. The first, ordinary people. The second, hot shots, big thinkers. And 1979, a tsunami was about to hit. The 1980s, the coming of the information age, the huge rise in computers. So this is just before that moment, ordinary citizens and hotshot thinkers speculating on what the future will be. How do you feel about uh, having a coworker who's a machine as opposed to a person? It don't really matter. It's less, you can't argue with it. It works the way you want it to. It does what it's supposed to do. It's better it doesn't have to be paid either. That's good. Explaining this to them. It's better than walking around delivering the stuff. Saves a lot of time. Not much. It'll go offline and it's hard to start up again. See, there's like little tracks right down there. And they get, it's got to be on the tracks or it'll stop and it won't go. It doesn't take long if you know what to do. Well, that's sound to go with Igor. Give me some idea of where we are, What, how much stuff there is here, what it's used for. Problems you have dealing with it all as a mountains of it. We have over 600 items in this corporation, about 300 of them forms. We have problems every day, mountains of them. Okay. Well, we have the place open two hours each day, whereas the departments in our corporation can come down and pick up supplies and carry them out on the, in their arms. At this time, we have all kind of questions like no one knows the item number, uh, wrong item numbers, wrong descriptions, you name it, we get it. Run through, not all 300, but forms. What kind of forms do you have? Just name them, as many as you can. A long list of forms. That's everything in the building. Everything is written on paper. If you make a phone call, you need to return it. It's written on a, a memo pad. If you want um have someone to do another job, you usually write it down, maybe, if the boss isn't around or if help isn't around. Do you ever feel that you're, you're, you're sinking under a mountain of forms or an ocean of... At least once a week. Tell At me. least once Tell a week. Me. We have so many forms, as you can see, that we could probably go into business ourselves. Do you ever feel it gets out, it's going to get out of control? Always. <laughs> but so far, not yet. Tell me how you feel about all the paper. I could burn it. <laughs> Can, is that good? <laughs> you think it would make any difference? Oh, yes. <laughs> I would probably burn my paycheck, too. <laughs> uh, if it's like this now, what's it going to be like 10 years from now? Triple as many forms. Okay, tell me. <laughs> Alone. Just paper. For everything. Everybody, every department. Uh, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to tell you a word, you tell me what comes to your mind. Okay. Bureaucracy. I couldn't say it. <laughs> I'm not supposed to mention it, but that's what comes to my mind. Government? Anything. Government. Good, bad, too much? Bad and too much. That was a point blank question. Why, did, why aren't you supposed to answer it? Well, that, that wasn't, the government wasn't the first thing that came to my mind, but the government was my second choice. The first? <laughs> We're dealing with here 37,000 to 47,000 reports per year. Without the computer, we would not be able to find various persons, places, and incidents. Therefore, it is essential that we use the computer. Do you ever get the feeling uh, that you're going to drown in paperwork or paper? Definitely. Again, without the computer, we couldn't survive. The paper is very important to us. We need things on paper, but we need the computer to centralize everything for us. A lot of people blame bureaucracy for our problems. I believe they only have themselves to blame. Our society is functioning 
around everything that's going on instead of trying to keep up with it. Computers are the thing. They will be the thing of the future. We need them. Our records have gotten too extensive. Our population has grown too much. We need them. We need some sort of a central filing system. Do you think it works better with all the new information and all the new computers and all the bureaucrats? Uh, no, uh, I don't uh, like the uh, bureaucrat part. I don't like politics uh, entered into uh, a government organization, and especially Social Security. It uh, never seemed to be political uh, up to this point, and uh, I don't uh, care to see it go political. I think uh, things uh, operate better without politics especially an office uh, where Social Security is serving the people. I think uh, politics are better off someplace else. <laughs> Second stick. There are 400,000 computers in this country and about 400,000 more in the rest of the world. That is, there are 800,000 computers all told. Now, that's not counting those little devices which are built into the radar ovens. These are real computers, computers of this kind. The interesting number is that these 400,000 machines do the work of about 5 trillion people, 5 trillion clerical workers. The whole world has only a population of 4 billion people. These machines do the work of 1,000 times more people than the whole world has. Every technology that mankind has ever developed uh, sort of rises sharply and then continues up and eventually sort of flattens out. Now, the technology curve usually is a curve that takes about 70 years. When you think of, of uh, sailboats or of steamboats or of uh, diesel boats or uh, airplanes, whatever. Computers, we are still down here. We are still down here. We are on our way up to the real phenomenal impact of these machines. That is a, f that is a future which is marvelous, where uh, knowledge becomes instantaneously available to everybody at a touch of a button. I suppose my gutsy response is to, is, to be, uh, is to be romantic about an earlier period when things were slow. I can, uh, I can have fun recalling my early days when uh, the only magazine that came into our house was National Geographic. I grabbed it and read it from cover to cover. Uh, we played radio. We didn't listen to radio. We had no TV. That seemed, uh, in my memory bank, uh, a kind of innocent, uh, satisfying world. But intellectually, I know it's uh, not for me. Um, when I put aside my sentiment and come to my uh, intellectual interpretation, I say, this is a magnificent world. And I see, what were we on? I forgot what we were on. We were... Information is power, in the, especially in the sense that it is available for those who are already powerful. And the great problem, one of the great problems I think we face, is that we don't know how to deliberately, as a society, move that power to the people who are powerless or who need more power to get fairness, equity, justice, and to redistribute the opportunities to make decisions in the society. One has now the view that the class structure is divided as between those who have information and those who do not, those who have access to information and those who must function out of ignorance. I made uh, this argument, uh, oh, 20 years ago in the Affluent Society, arguing, uh, the term was not original with me, that there was developing a new class in all of the democratic societies, which had its power as the result of its access, not to money, not to property, but to knowledge. And this I believe to be the case. And I, think part, and I think there is a, a class division in modern society as between people who have access to information, access to knowledge, and those who do not. This is the reason why we have 
a certain angry reference to elites from time to time. This was, uh, I suppose, part of the reason why uh, Spiro Agnew, a man who no one would accuse, accuse of being excessively informed, uh, expressed himself so angrily about the uh, snobbish uh, elites. It's uh, uh, not something to be accepted as inevitable because it is a form of class distinction that can be eliminated by education and I would suppose is part of the great modern case for uh, more and better and more egalitarian educational opportunity. If you look at society as simply the collective contribution of millions of human beings who carry in themselves certain power and influence and emotion and every time you you turn the switch off of one of those persons you've dampened the glow we cannot afford to increasingly see society controlled by a smaller and smaller group who deal with narrower and narrower specializations because we not only distort and limit we caricature what you might in almost a spiritual sense see the total beauty of the total contribution. So I see this not only as a matter of being kind to someone else in a kind of self-serving, sentimental way. It's the fundamental question of whether this society is going to find a way to make itself as, in, as rich and as powerful and, if you will, as beautiful as potentially it can be. I suppose one has to wonder whether there hasn't been a breakdown in confidence in all institutions, and some will say uh, is there anything in which one can have confidence nowadays? Uh, corporations are suspect, the government is suspect, the bureaucracy, universities, uh, professions, lawyers. I must tell you that I worry uh, less about this uh, than most of my liberal friends, most of my conservative friends. When I first went to Harvard long, longer ago than I like to think, 40 years ago, Harvard was a, in some ways a magic name. It was, uh, it was preeminently above criticism, even by, uh, certainly by its students, certainly by its alumni, and a very substantial, and also by, for that matter, by its faculty. Uh, and it wasn't that good. Uh, a great many of our students, well, as I said many times in the 40 years I've been at that university, it's transformed itself from a rather low-grade aristocracy to a somewhat imper imperfect meritocracy. And uh, uh, one of the reasons Harvard uh, wasn't criticized in the 1930s when it was changing over from a finishing school for the rich to a serious intellectual institution was that it had a great many people around who weren't intellectually capable of, capable of criticism. Uh, there's much less confidence in the university now than there was then, and uh, I regard this as a very much happier situation. But I would also say that uh, we must continue to believe that things work. Some things work because they obviously, obviously they do. Uh, uh, we get things done, life goes on, and uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is something which uh, I, I think we should continue to suppose uh, will be so. This is Head Slate, camera roll 20. For most people, they experience the invasion of privacy in the form of junk mail or junk phone calls or threats to credit rating, which still are on the margins of their life. But supposing our political freedoms begin to be interfered with, the, as things are going, that could happen. And if that does happen, these information banks, these uh, profiles of people, this completeness of uh, documentation of everybody's life, is a fearful potential threat. Information is the bloodstream of bureaucracy. It's the nerve center of bureaucracy. The thing that has saved us up to now is that the bureaucracies haven't been that efficient. Now, with this new information, they have a mechanism of control. 
it, that is what information is used for. The question arises, who is the information for? I think one of the things that causes people to feel uneasy is a feeling that the information is for everybody but the public, for everybody but the consumer, for every special interest, but not for the general interest, not for me, not for you, not for the people down the block, but for institutions to do their number. And their number is a number that as often is not done on me. I suppose there's no question that is so often asked about information as to whether there is an inherent uh, a moral right to know. I would say, I, without the slightest hesitation, that there is a right to know. I've been in and out of public, uh, public position a good part of my life, and I've said many times I've never made a mistake, I've never done something foolish without the thought immediately crossing my mind, I wonder if this could be kept out of uh, public print. I wonder if somehow or other this could be, uh, uh, publicity on this could be avoided. I didn't always admit that to myself at the time. And most of the things that we have, uh, most of the great mistakes of uh, past years have been things that have been conducted without the uh, illumination and without the discussion of uh, of, uh, of the public and of the Congress. There are things on which a measure of confidentiality is uh, appropriate, uh, plans for negotiations, health of foreign statesmen, uh, gossip of that sort, but uh, very quickly uh, this uh, becomes uh, public knowledge anyway. Uh, the time, uh, the, the uh, half-life of the needed secrecy is only a few days. We're not fully into the office of the future. I'm sure there are some companies that are a little further ahead than we are, uh, but we're getting there. We have, as a matter of fact, a, a word processing system in our headquarters, in our corporation office, that I guess is about as far ahead as any in the country, and that's just one small piece of the office of the future. But in this process of converting to the office of the future, and by that I simply mean that instead of sending letters on hard paper, on hard copy, through the mails, we'll be sending them over electronic um, uh, media. And instead of receiving that letter in your in-basket one day, you'll receive it on a TV screen on your tabletop. And instead of filing that letter in the file cabinet, it'll, it'll be filed in the computer and you can pull it up whenever you wish to. If you want to review it, you push a button and there it appears. As for the future of science, I think that if I were just starting, that I might like to try to tackle the last really big frontier that I know of, and that is how the mind works. It seems to me that's an area where it's very difficult to do very precise experiments particularly experiments on the single cell or molecular level, but it is an area where almost nothing is known. And uh, if I had a lifetime to begin, I might begin there.